Wow, Jesus. I love the idea that when we get to heaven, that all of our time is going to be spent worshiping. It's, I, I love learning about him. I, I love, I mean, I love prayer. I love seeing prayers answered. It, it's, it's so much fun. But once we get there, we're, we're not going to have any need to pray. There's, we're not going to be lacking anything. We're not going to need anything. There's not going to be anything wrong that needs to be fixed. There's not going to be any, any sickness that needs to be healed. There's not going to be any disappointment that needs to be uh, encouraged. It, it, it's all going to be there. there there's going to be perfect provision. Like, there's there's going to be nothing to pray for. All that's going to be left is the constant recognition of how astounding and amazing He is. And we're going to spend eternity discovering His goodness. Uh, there's this verse that says that His goodness causes us to fear Him. Our God is so good it's scary. Like, it's just overwhelming how good He is. And, and the more that we can anchor that in our hearts, it, it begins to change everything. It begins to change the way that we engage Him. Uh, it, the way that we pray. If you don't realize that God is good, then you're praying to try to get God to do something good. You ever tried to pray that way? <laughs> God, I know the better way of doing things. Listen to me and it would be better than what you're doing. Like we, we would never think that. We would never let ourselves think that. But, but we, we recognize when, when that is coming that there's something going on. Maybe if I move that, it'll help the ring. Um, that there's something going on in our hearts that, that doesn't really, really trust in His goodness. And there, there's, 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 I mean, there's always an invitation, but you know, part of that invitation to intimacy that Joni just shared, that he wants to meet with us, that as we worship, as we give him praise, as we recognize who he is, that he's going to pour out the oil of intimacy on us, that there is an anchoring in that of his goodness that He's re-anchoring our hearts. And, and, and as you press into that, as you're, as you're spending that time with Him, let your worship be that, that recognition of His goodness and keep it anchored in there because there, there's something that He wants to release, a stability in our hearts, a stability in our spirits where we become anchored in how good He is and it'll begin to transform the way that we interact with the world around us. Because if you ever forget that God is good, this world is scary. I mean, if you look around without the filter of God's goodness, anxiety is the only option. Or, or blindness, or medicating somehow, hiding. Like that, 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 that's the only option. But once you recognize that His goodness and you can engage with this world and in the midst of the stuff that's going on, hold on to hope and look for more that's coming. Look for the better that He has promised, realizing that we get that now and there's an ultimate fulfillment that is coming. Yea, God. So Lord, we do ask that You would release to us that that greater revelation of Your goodness, that it would so settle into our hearts and our spirits that it would become the foundation that we stand on and, and the glasses that we see through, that, that it would cause everything that we experience to, to be seen through Your goodness. That even in our pain, that we could see that there's redemption. E even in our disappointment, we could see that it's not your desire for bad to happen. Lord, that we would see your goodness. We would trust in your goodness. We would have greater faith to ask you for what you already want to give.
Father, I'm asking that you would continue to teach us to pray. Lord, I I know our, our prayer life comes out of our thoughts of who you are. What we believe about you is going to determine how and what we pray, when we pray, why we, why we pray. Lord, I'm asking you would continually reframe in our hearts who you are. And Lord, we, we come as your disciples did and we say, Lord, teach us how to pray. We, we want to know how to pray. We want to be a people of prayer. Lord, your word says to pray without ceasing. How, how can we live a life that, that never stops praying? Lord, we, we want to live that life. We want our lives to be prayer. That it's not just something that we do, but something that we are. Lord, teach us to pray. Well, as we continue our series on prayer, we're going to talk a little bit about praying the scriptures. Um, it's actually, a, a, there's, a, there's more than one way to pray the scriptures. I'm, I'm going at this in a very particular way. I'm looking at going to scriptures as a launching point to engage the presence of God so that scriptures change us and lead us into an encounter where we meet with him. Uh, there's also a place of warfare, which that's going to be a separate place. We'll talk about how to war with Scripture, but also war with prophetic promises that He's given us. We'll do that at another time, but, but today I really want to talk about this, this place uh, of what's traditionally been called Lectio Divina, or divine reading, where we go to Scripture, and, and in Scripture we begin to find this, this place of encounter where we find the God that likes to hide in His Word. God is not, or the Word is not God. Let me put it that way. The Scripture is not God, but God really likes to hide in the Word. Now, you can go to Scripture and not find God. But if you have the Spirit within you, it's really hard to go to Scripture and not find God. That it's actually a place that He has called us to encounter. A Word that God speaks never stops speaking. It just continues to go and to go and to go and to go. When he said, let there be light, that word is still continuing, which is why there's a universe. That word is still holding everything together. That, that, originally, that original word spoken, if that word were to ever stop, there would be no such thing as a material universe. It wouldn't just turn into dust. Like there would be nothing at all. It's the word itself that holds all things together, that frames the worlds. And so when he speaks, there's, there's power, there's life that is there. And, and the word that we have, the scripture, it says in 2 Timothy that it was actually breathed out by God. That, that it, was, it was released of his breath, that it was him that inspired this word. And there, there are historical things that happen that Scripture talks about. But even in the history, there's more than mere history. There's, there's an experience and there's a release of who He is that is being communicated in Scripture. John chapter 5, Jesus is talking to the people in His day that knew the most about Scripture. It's amazing you can know a lot about Scripture and not know Scripture. And these guys proved it. We, we often call them the, the Pharisees. They, they would have much of the, the Torah, the first five books of Scripture, would have been memorized. They, they would be able to quote. They, they would be able to point. Someone would start reading and they could finish the verses. Uh, many of them, it was part of their training because it, it, was, it was how they would ingest. They spent their lives studying and pouring over, meditating and reading on Scripture. And, and, and so they had a lot of Scripture knowledge, but they were missing something important. In verse 39 and 40, so John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, he says, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I, 
I'm going to avoid the rabbit trail of philosophy. I, want to, I could explore that for a long time and what words are and how words represent realities but are not realities. I'll leave it just with that phrase. Words represent realities but they are not realities. This word represents the reality of God but it's not the reality of God. The scripture itself, the Bible represents, it communicates, it gives us the picture, but it's pointing to something beyond itself that is the reality. And if we get stuck on the word and never go beyond to the reality, we lose what the scripture is actually saying. And scripture, the, the words of scripture are supposed to be this place where we, where we go to, to go beyond the words, seeing what they represent and finding the one that they represent. If someone is blind and someone explains a tree, they have all the words talking about a tree, but they've never experienced a tree. Now, maybe at some point in time, somebody takes them and they get to feel the tree. Now they have an experience that when they hear the word tree, it actually means something. Until you've actually felt God, Scripture is just words without real meaning. They're describing something, and the words are all accurate, but without the experience, you don't have something to hold on to to realize what it is that's there. And so how do we go to Scripture to go through Scripture to the reality that Scripture is calling us towards? When we engage the Spirit of God, Scripture becomes a launching point for encounter. It's through the Spirit. It's when the Spirit comes into us. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is explaining well, he's not explaining this. He's explaining the understanding of the new covenant that we have, but in it he gives this understanding. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, it says, To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. You can read Scripture and not be able to see the reality that Scripture leads to. It just becomes a veil. That there, you can't get beyond it. That there's something actually has to happen to be able to get beyond the information that's there into the reality that's being communicated, into the one that's being talked about. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. When we turn to Jesus, then that veil gets removed. You search the scriptures all day long, but you do not come to me that you may have life. So when we come to him, then we start to recognize that all of those scriptures are actually revealing something that's there. Now, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When we come to him, his spirit comes into us. We become a new creation. And then scripture is not just words on a page. But it's the sound of our God calling us to encounter. It becomes a place where we can meet with him. So this picture of this practice of Lectio Divina, divine reading, uh, it, there's, you could see kind of pieces of this even in the Psalms. You can see pieces of what we're going to be talking about. But the practice, as I'm going to describe, the basic practice, really comes out of the first few centuries of Christianity and has been talked about in almost every age of Christianity as a way to engage God. And so... When, when John Paul and I wrote the book, The Art of Praying the Scriptures, using some teachings out of his Art of Hearing God and uh, putting some pieces together, we, we separated it into steps. So steps that you would do as part of this practice. So this is going to be a very practical message from here. So your first step to Lectio Divina is to prepare. If you're going to spend time with God, you, you want to prepare yourself. Relax. Settle in. Remove distractions. Put your phone on no notifications. Do not disturb. Airplane mode, whatever it is. Get to a place where you can actually begin to focus. Let, letting go of stress. Um, the, the Quakers in the 1600s, 1700s, they, they would have this practice they would call centering prayer. 
And one of the ways that they would do it is they would sit and they would put their hands, palm up on their knees, and they would think about all the things that they were responsible for family, harvest, whatever it was that they were responsible for. And they would breathe in just all the way to those things. And then they would put their hands down and they would just release it into the hands of the Lord. And they would do that as often as it took for them to stop worrying about all the things that they were responsible for. And they could, they could just stay centered on the presence of God. Um, uh, Madame Gune, in Experiencing the Depths of Christ, she, she talks about finding the presence of God within, where, where we quiet ourselves and we realize if He lives in us, we can find His presence within us. And, and we, we pay attention to the reality that He is in us and with us. And in that place, other things just begin to, to lose their hold on us. And we're able to engage with Him, so we relax. Breathing is, is really helpful. There's a reason why in Hebrew and Greek, the word for spirit and the word for breath are the same. Like there's, there's life that is available. And so as, as we breathe in, I mean, so I, I use that example, the, the Quakers, they would breathe in all the stuff and then breathe it out to release it. One of, the other, one of the other practices that others have done is they, they would breathe out everything that's in me that's not of you, I breathe out. And there'd be like a prayer of repentance. Just I, I release my, my anxiety, I release my stress, I release my sin, I release my guilt, and then I breathe in the Spirit and breathing in the Spirit. So the, there's different ways of doing it, but coming to that place where we're letting go of our anxieties and we're, we're relaxing. The, the psalmist says in one place, I have quieted my soul like a weaned child within me. My soul is quieted. You think, think about a child that just got done being fed. What's the first thing they do? They're just, they're all relaxed and they go to sleep. Right? That place where we can quiet our soul, where we're just satisfied with him. And we're quiet. And in that place, now we're ready to meet with him. Step two is recognize. Recognize that this is his invitation. That he's invited you to meet with him. You're not trying to convince him to meet with you. He has called you. He has chosen you. Recognize that he wants to meet with you, recognize, coming back to that place, recognizing his presence within you. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are saved. Like we're, we're recognizing that reality that we're in him. He's in us. We're in him. We're united. That, that understanding that Jesus was communicating in the high priestly prayer, the, the union that we have with the Father, that we have with the Son, that they have with each other because of the spirit that's within us recognize and then step three is to listen we've quieted ourselves we've relaxed we're recognizing his presence and then we're listening this is a place where you would pray a prayer like psalm 139 search me O god and know my heart see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the everlasting way Lord, is there anything in me that would hinder what you want to do? You have to be aware of condemnation versus conviction. Oh, yeah, there's something like you, you can't come near. Oh, well, what did I do? Well, you're bad. All right, no, that's not God. Shut up. <laughs> like that, that's not God. That's general. There's nothing to do. You said this to so-and-so. Oh, now that's conviction. I did that. God, I'm sorry I did that. You've been harboring this in your heart. Oh, God, I've been harboring that in my heart. I, I don't want that. Condemnation is general. It's just like this other something wrong. Like you, you can't get really close. Conviction says you did this, and then once we let go of it, it's gone. So we're asking him to search our hearts. Now notice, 
Search me, O God, not search me, O my mind. We're not trying to figure out in our heads what we've done wrong. Because we will start trying to deal with stuff that God does, isn't ready to deal with in our lives. He knows the path that we need, and he knows the timing. He will bring up what he wants to bring up, and if he doesn't bring it up, that's his choice. He'll get to it. I mean, he's got all the time in the world, and he can make more if he runs out. So, I mean, he's not in as much of a hurry as we often are. And trust him in that place. So we prepare, we recognize, we listen, and then we go to a passage of Scripture. And we read a passage. Now, it's good to have already figured out before you get started what passage. Or just trust that you're going to open. Sometimes the Bible roulette stuff, it, sometimes it can be helpful. Sometimes it's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're, you want to at least have a feel. Like, I, I know I'm just going to open up and I'm going to get to the right place. Or... Um, like actually when, when we get to the end of this we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2 like there, there's going to be a passage and when you get to that passage don't, don't get a long passage um, depends on how much time you have but it, the longer the passage you're not going to actually be able to do this practice this is not your Bible reading that you do for the day and it's not Bible study uh, this is meditating this is contemplating so, so you want a, a, a size that's small enough that you can bite because you need to chew. So if you try to put a whole steak in your mouth, it's really hard to eat it. But if you put one bite, you can chew it up and you can get something out of it. So that's the idea. You, you find a passage. Maybe it's a few verses. Maybe it's a single verse. Maybe it's 10, 12 verses. And that, that's about the extent that you really want to do with a practice like this. Um, if it's appropriate, put your name in the passage. So, I mean, when we're going to go through Ephesians chapter 2, most of it is saying you is in plural, which is going to work because we're, we're doing this in a group. If we were going to do it individually, wherever it says you, I, I would just say me or I. Inserting, making it personal, putting myself in there, because I'm, I'm listening for what the Spirit is saying to me. I'm not trying to change Scripture. I'm trying to engage with Scripture and apply it into my life and hear what the Spirit is saying. Now, know the passage that you're doing that to before you get going. Because if it's one of the passages, say, you know, um, where is it? Isaiah 14, where it's talking about Satan. You don't want to put me in the passage. <laughs> You leave that one alone, right? <laughs> like, so know, know the passage before you start putting your name in it. But if it's appropriate, put your name in it. Read it out loud slowly. You're not in a hurry. Not trying to see how many words you can get in. You're not putting the podcast at 1.25 so you can get it through faster. This is time to savor. Just read it slowly. Read it. Maybe, maybe you'll read it out loud a couple of times. And then wherever you start to feel the Holy Spirit, just there's an emphasis. I, I often call it like Holy Spirit highlighter. That phrase, like there's something on that. I don't know what it is. Or that felt important. Or it's like that just stuck out. Just stay there. You don't have to get through the whole passage. You can stay on one phrase. You can stay on one word, one verse the whole time and just stay on that passage. Maybe you repeat that a few times and then you finish if you feel the release to keep on going. If you don't feel the release to keep on going, just stay there. I, I, I've had times where I've done this and I got stuck on one word. And I spent the whole time on one word. And other times it was larger passages. Sometimes it was a phrase. Sometimes it was a verse. Read it slowly a couple times. You can do this in a group. We've done this in small groups where we'll have two or three different people read it because they're probably going to pick up different things. Holy Spirit's going to highlight different things. They're also going to have a different voice. Once you've experienced something, you, you, you start to know what you've experienced. And so you put the next experience in the package with the last experience. 
So having different voices saying it allows you to re-experience it for the first time, if you will, which allows it to, to carry more life. So read it slowly and then stop where he calls you to stop. And if you're given permission, keep on going. So you prepared, you recognize, you've listened, now you've read the passage. Then the third part is to pray. God, what are you saying? What, what, what does this mean to me? What, what, are, what, are, you, what are you speaking to me? What, what are you saying to me out of this? What, 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 what do I need to hear in this? What is it that you're communicating? Is there, is there an application? Now, this does not have to be the using Bible study standards. You're not trying to figure out what this meant to the original audience when they heard it. That's, that's to understand what the scripture means. But sometimes God will use the scripture to speak now. It is not the interpretation of the scripture, but it can be an application of the scripture to you. This is looking for God's voice in the scripture, not necessarily how it fits. And you could argue that this is most likely what was happening in the upper room because when Peter stands up and he says, hey, we need to get a new apostle, the scriptures that he uses are completely taken out of context and there's no way that the original listeners would have thought that it meant what Peter was saying what, that it meant. But he wasn't trying to interpret the scripture and saying this is what this scripture means for everybody. He was saying this is what God is saying to us right now for us to respond. So in that place, there is a place for God to use Scripture to breathe on it, to speak a word for that moment. And it's not the word for all people at all time, but it is a word for this person or this group of people for this time. Allow him to do that because he can use that to speak something very particular. Maybe it's just for a season, but maybe it's a life verse that he anchors something in you that's only for you, that you get to carry. So you're asking him to cause that word to come alive, to make it real to you, to show you what he's saying in it, and what you should do or what you should believe. And that prayer goes right into the next step, which is to contemplate. The idea of contemplation or, or meditation is something that, that we don't spend a lot of time with in our time. It's becoming a little bit more popular in the last 20 years, the idea of meditation. I mean, most of you got a, a watch, there's a breathing meditation little app. Like, it, it's becoming a, a thing. Like, we're realizing that there's actually something to slowing down, that it's not all about the mind. We're, we're starting to reset some of what was lost in the enlightenment period and, and starting to come back to a, a little, maybe a, well, we'll see, but hopefully a, a better picture of the fullness of humanity where we're not just brains. There's a little bit more to human than reason. Um, but all that being said, the idea of meditation in, in the, the original language, it has the picture of ruminating, which is what, what a cow does. They ruminate. So cows have five stomachs. So they, they get some grass or some hay or whatever it is that they're eating. They chew on it, 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 and then they swallow it, and it goes down into the first stomach. A little bit later, they regurgitate that back into their mouth, and they chew on it some more, 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 and then they swallow it again, and it goes back into another stomach. So it's there for a while. Then they regurgitate it and they chew on it and they chew on it and they chew on it. They're getting every little bit that they can out of that food. That's what we do to the word. We, we, we get it. Take, reading it is like taking that bite. Praying through it, asking God to speak. That, that's the chewing process. But this contemplation process is where it's sitting in our spirit and the nutrients are starting to get into our spirit, starting to transform us, starting to change us. We find ourselves thinking differently. We find ourselves being differently. We, 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 just, we recognize there's a transformation that's going on in this process. 
It's not necessarily the mind that is doing all of this. Now, it can be helpful to hold the mind on that place so that the mind doesn't wander and take us away from what God is doing. So that phrase, sometimes I'll just repeat that same phrase and just repeat it in my heart, repeat it internally, sometimes externally, but usually internally. I'll just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until I get there. Until I'm feeling it. And anytime my mind starts to wander away from it, I just come back and I say it again. Bring myself back to that place of focus, letting it saturate in my spirit. And, and sometimes what will happen is, is I, I've had things where I've done that process for over a decade, where I started the process through Lectio Divina. And a couple months later, I'm driving down the road and it starts coming back up and I just start to meditate on again, pray through it again, read through it again, read through it again. And, and, and a lot of these things have become understandings that have anchored my life. They, they've, they've formed me. They, they've been a major way that God has formed who I am in him, where I can see more of him in me through this process of meditation, holding ourselves in that place of the Spirit. So the first step is to prepare. Then we recognize this is His invitation. We listen. What are you saying? We read the passage. Then we pray. God, what are you doing? What what do I need to repent of? What do I need to understand? How does this apply to me? What are you speaking? Then we contemplate, we ponder and wait. And then the next step is to abide. Now, the thing with abide, you you can't always get here. It's not something that you can choose to do these steps and get to the point. So some, of the, some of the writers would call this union. You, you, you look at like John of the Cross or Teresa of Avila and... and um, uh, the cloud of unknowing would, would use the, the same kind of understanding. That this place of union where, where it's this place of engaging with the Spirit of God where the mind is no longer driving anything. It's almost like an observer rather than a driver. And you, you're so caught up in His presence that you can't realize where you end and He begins like you're, you're so caught up in him that he's just everything and you're in him and, and timelessness. You, you lose track of time. I mean, it could be seconds and it feels like hours. It could be hours and it feels like minutes or seconds. Like you, you just, you lose track of time. And, and this, this, this place of union with him, it, it, it's, it's something only he does. And, and I, mean, I would love to say that it was a normal thing. I, I've had the experience a handful of times. But those handful of times have done something inside of me that I'll spend the rest of my life looking for that again because it was so beautiful, so amazing. It was such a gift. And that's what we're going to get. That's eternity is going to be like that. Caught, so caught up where we're fully known, even as well, like we fully know him, even as we're fully known. Like that, that place of, of recognizing that we're in him and he is in us and we're in each other. Like that place of the union, the unity of the spirit that can't be gotten to but we're called to maintain to the best of our ability. Sometimes you go into visions in this place. Sometimes words begin to form. Sometimes ideas. Sometimes conversations. Sometimes it's just a sense of his peace. You, you come out of it and, and you don't even realize. Sometimes th- this, this will often, not, not often, but in that place, that, that's the easiest place to go into a biblical trance. Where Peter was meditating and he goes into a trance and he begins to see and hear and experience the sheep being let down and the voice coming to him and it anchors something important that was important for him but also important for, for, for the church. Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2 it's the cry of the psalmist for this. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. 
The sons of Korah wrote as a deer pants for flowing streams. So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Like th this cry, it just everything in me just wants to be in your presence. There's something there that feeds me. There's something there that gives me, like we were reading in Psalm 23 in the transition, like the, that, that place of quiet waters, of green pastures where I'm satisfied, I'm resting. I can feel his nearness. It's an amazing invitation. When you start to feel that lift or when the contemplation ends, if you go into that, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Like I said, you can't make that happen. If you put yourself into a trance, it's not a good deal. Never put yourself into a trance. Because you have to figure out, one, you have to figure out how to protect yourself while you're there, and you have to figure out how to get back out of it. And it's not as easy as what you would think. It's a dangerous place to put yourself into a trance. Like, but when you present yourself before the Lord and He draws you in, there is no danger there. So we've, we've given us this idea in, in, in kind of modern charismatic, charismania, if you will, like we're in control of our spiritual experiences. You are not in control of a true spiritual experience. If you're in control, it's a soulish experience. Now we present ourselves and offer ourselves and God takes over and we realize that he's there. That's a real spiritual experience. So I talk about that again all day, but I'm not going to go there because I want to get to where I'm done. When you come out, journal. Journal what it was. Sometimes you're not going to even have words for what it was you experienced. It's just feelings. It's not really thoughts that you're able to put together. Sometimes you do have thoughts. Sometimes you do have pieces. Write it down. Journal it. Treasure it. Because that's one of the ways that we tell God that what he gave us is important. It's one of the ways that we value what it is but it's also we, we think that we're never going to forget it and there are some things that you never forget like they get etched in your spirit and there's some things you think are going to be etched in your spirit and then an hour later you're like i like something happened um <laughs> it was so important how did i ever forget that and it just goes and if we're trusting our mind to hold on that we don't put our trust here. Write it down. Journal it. Treasure it. Because it's important. Sometimes you're going to go back and, and look at those things. And, they, and, and sometimes when you reread them, you go right back into that experience. And sometimes it's just that reminder. Wow, you really did say that. It's amazing how often you, you find something that you wrote in your journal right when you need to hear it again. Something he wrote down five years ago, seven years ago, and it's like, oh, I needed that. <laughs> like, I wrote that then for now. So those things, those things are important. Now, you're going to do this multiple times. I mean, you, you, you can do this practice every day. You can do it once a week. You could do it, I, I would suggest doing it on a regular basis till it becomes normal. It'll transform the way you read the Bible. It's completely changed the way that I read the Bible. I used to read the Bible so I could get through, so I could say that I'd read the Bible. So I could get information because I wanted to understand. Now I find myself, when I'm, I'm reading Scripture, if I'm reading Scripture and, and I'm not consciously aware of His presence, I... I I feel like I'm not actually reading scripture. I just stop and I go back to these first steps coming into that place of presence before I continue on. Because I don't want to read scripture without him. I don't want to search the scriptures all day long and not come to him to find life. I'm not looking for information. I'm looking for transformation. And transformation only comes through encounter. It only comes through encounter. So, you guys want to practice? So prepare yourself. Think about relaxing. Invite the Lord to come. 
any anxious thoughts, just begin to release that. Breathe out, breathe in. Recognize that this is an invitation from him. He wants to meet with us. He, he chose the ones that would be in this room this morning, those that are going to be listening online. He, 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 he chose this time. It was his desire. Now, Lord, search us. Lord, is there anything in our hearts, anything in our lives that would hinder what you want to say and what you want to do? We just surrender that right now. If anything comes to mind, just, just give it to him. Whatever allows you to pay attention, whether it's eyes open or eyes closed, just go ahead and start to focus in while I read Ephesians chapter 2. And we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, being rich in mercy, Mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace we have been saved and raised us up with him seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith. This is not our doing. It is the gift 
of God. This is not our doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, we were children of disobedience, doing whatever we wanted, whatever we thought was right, but you had mercy. But you had mercy. Your love, your astounding great love, because you're so rich in mercy, your great love chose us, saved us, set us free. We are no longer subject to the powers of this air, powers of this world. We're no longer children of wrath. We're chosen. We're beloved. We're no longer dead, but we're alive. And we're in you. We're in, we're in you. We're in you. You're seated on the throne in the midst of those creatures crying holy. You're seated on the throne given to you by the Father and we're seated with you in you in heavenly places. What grace you've shown us. What mercy you've shown us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But you gave it. You gave it so free. Oh God. Lord, we are your workmanship. You formed us. You designed us. You made us beautiful. You made us your poem. Your masterpiece. And you put in front of us good works things for us to do. Lord, what are they? What are the good works that you have planned? You've been dreaming of. You, you planned them. You set them in place beforehand. They've already been in your heart. Even before you chose us, before you saved us, you'd already had these good plans, these good works planned. Lord, what are they? Show us.
But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Lord, grant a revelation of that love, great love. Not just love, great love. Abounding love, more than enough love. Not love without passion, but fiery love. Great love. Lord, I don't want to just hear it with my head. I want to know it in my heart. Let me experience that great love. Let me know that love. I want to encounter that love, God. Lord, I see it in my life. I see the transformation. I see the change. I see how you've loved. I see how you have done great things. But I know that there's more. There's more love to experience. Lord, you're giving it. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to ignore a portion of the love that you're pouring out. I don't want to be satisfied before you are. I don't want to be satisfied before you are. I want all of it, God. You paid for it. You bought it because you are rich in mercy. With great love, you loved us. Don't let us settle. That great love. While we were still dead in our trespasses, when we didn't deserve it, when we didn't, we couldn't earn it. That great love. You looked upon us with affection. You didn't look upon us with disappointment. You looked upon us with affection. Rich in mercy. Great love. Pour out great love, God. Just in your hearts, just begin to respond. Whatever parts that touched your heart, respond to Him. Jesus, we're so grateful.
I let this presence and this peace rest upon us throughout this day. Hold our hearts attentive to you. Lord, continue to draw us into intimacy. Give us the hunger of the psalmist as the deer pants for the water brook. So pants my soul for you. My soul longs for you. Don't let busyness steal our hunger. Don't let anxiety and pressures and responsibilities steal our hunger. Don't let the weight and the distractions of the world steal our hunger. You formed us for you, and only in you will we be satisfied. Make us a people of prayer, O oh God, whose hearts are anchored on you, whose minds are stayed on you. You will set him in perfect place, peace, whose mind is set on you. When we choose to set our minds on you, set your mind on the things of the Spirit which is life and peace, not on the flesh, which is death. Those who walk by the Spirit of God have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Set our minds. The peace would be our portion. The intimacy would be our reward. You are our very great reward in Jesus name amen amen the Lord bless you may his peace continue to rest on you throughout this week if not before we'll see you next Sunday bless you guys